Venezuela denounces before the United Nations a massive cyber attack against the country as part of a destabilization operation. In Russia, a fire broke out in the cooling facilities of the Saporizhia nuclear power plant following a Ukrainian shelling of the town of Enerkodar. In Palestine, Israeli occupation forces killed at least two journalists this Sunday, bringing the total death toll to 168 journalists killed since last October. Hello, welcome from the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Resort Studios in Havana, Cuba. We we'll begin with the news. Venezuela denounced before the United Nations a massive cyber attack against the country, which is part of a destabilization operation. During the United Nations Convention Against Cybercrime, Venezuela's alternate ambassador to the UN, Joaquin Perez, said that crimes have been committed through information and communication technologies aimed at meddling in destabilizing and promoting coups d'etat. He further pointed out that these so-called cybercrimes are used in a criminal manner to advance disinformation campaigns. The diplomat also indicated that Venezuela, in addition to this electoral system, has also received cyber attacks against the national electricity system and other strategic sectors, including the oil and gas industry. Also in Venezuela, the President of the Supreme Court of Justice, Caris Lía Rodríguez, announced that only 33 of the 38 political parties presented the required electoral material. In accordance with the referred subpoena, the 38 political parties involved appeared before the court in a timely manner. 33 of them submitted the required electoral material. The Cuban government denied on Saturday in a official statement the allegation of its involvement in modifying the results of the presidential elections held in that country on July 28th. They stated four main points. First, it is absolutely false that specialists in computer science or any other area would have traveled from Cuba to Venezuela with the purpose of modifying the results of the presidential elections in that country. Second, these unfounded and fabricated accusations by the former high Colombian official Francisco Santos is not accompanied by evidence because it does not exist. Third, the promoter of this lie is known for his active participation in misrepresentation campaigns and for his involvement in several political scandals. In 2021, he invented that the commander of a Colombian armed guerrilla group, Ivan Marquez, would be in Cuba, which was flatly denied by reality. Last, the politically motivated construction of a matrix of lies that attributes to Cuba responsibilities in the results achieved by the contenders in the elections in Venezuela is assumed as the truth by those who traditionally participate in the campaigns of misrepresentations about Cuba. Meanwhile, in Colombia, 40 of the 98 military personnel held in the community of San Jose del Guaviare were freed. The kidnapped soldiers belong to the Joint Task Force Omega, which has expressed its concern and urged the release of the soldiers who have been held captive since last Friday. The first medical report indicated that the first release prisoners were in good health, although they were transferred to a battalion for a more exhaustive physical and mental examination. The National Army declared that it is working with the Public Prosecutor's Office to secure the release of the 58 remaining soldiers at the same time that it holds meetings and security councils in the area to take action on what happened. And the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, Margaret Sutherwhite, warned of inequalities in access to justice in Chile. On her two-week visit to the country, the rapporteur alerted to the existence of a justice gap that splits the rich and the poor. Those legal services provided depends on citizens' social class, economic means, and connections. Likewise, the authority noted that while the wealthy benefit from a system that allows them to expedite their cases to avoid convictions, the underprivileged find themselves embroiled in cumbersome procedures and receive harsher sentences. Sather White underscored that this difference is intertwined with discrimination that hinders the fair assistance of communities of indigenous peoples, migrants, and Afro-descendants. And also, the Peruvian justice confirmed the annulment of former President Alberto Fujimori's indictment for forced sterilizations. A Peruvian court dismissed the legal case against Fujimori, who between 1990 and 2000 ordered the execution of forced sterilizations on nearly 200,000 poor and indigenous women. The decision to dismiss this case came one day after the approval of Law 32107, known as the Amnesty Law, which de facto decreased the prescription 
of war crimes and crimes against humanity committed before June 1, 2002. Experts clarify that the decision does not prohibit the refiling of the indictment, but only annuls the opening order of the investigation of the case and returns it to the filing stage. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you'll find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. In Russia, a fire broke out in the cooling facilities of the Saporish nuclear power plant following a Ukrainian shelling of the town of Enerkodar. The authorities declare that currently all six power units of the power plant are in a cold shutdown, assuring that there is no threat of steam explosion or other consequences. The radiation background around the nuclear power plant and the city of Enerkodar is reported as normal. In this context, specialists from the Ministry of Emergencies are working at the site and the elimination of fire outbreaks is underway. In light of these events, Moscow criticizes IEA's lack of reaction after the Ukrainian attack on the Saporizhia nuclear power station. The official representative of the Russian Foreign Ministry, Maria Zaharova, criticized the lack of reaction of the International Atomic Energy Agency and its head, Rafael Grossi. The representative emphasized that after the Kiev regime, under the leadership of the collective West, destroyed its country, ruined the people of Ukraine, and undermined low energy and food security, it launched nuclear terror on the continent. Russian Commissioner for Human Rights Tatiana Moskolkova today called on the UN to condemn the terror unleashed by Ukraine with an armed incursion into Kursk province. Moskolkova assured that thousands of civilians have been affected by the brutal attack of the Ukrainian armed forces on the Kursk province and assured she expects this information to be included in the upcoming report of the UN Human Rights Office. Recently, Russian President Biden reporting accused Kiev of launching a large-scale provocation and discriminatory challenge, particularly against civilian facilities. On Wednesday, Russian forces halted an offensive by up to a thousand Ukrainian servicemen to occupy territories in Kursk province. In Italy, authorities declared red alert in 27 cities due to soaring temperatures. The National Weather Service reported that Florence, Rome, Palermo and Sicily are the cities with the highest heat levels since the beginning of July. The weather agency added that the high temperatures are due to the so-called African anti-cyclone event, a result of climate change. The African anti-cyclone is expected to last for the next 10 days. These 21st century anomalous heat waves are unfortunately caused by the anthropogenic greenhouse effect. Man has made the planet warmer since 1850 by burning fossil fuels more and more. And then in recent weeks and months we have also had the frequent presence of the African anticyclone, which however also seems to be connected to climate change. Therefore, it is already warmer with the greenhouse effect and then all this warming, also of the oceans and seas, favors a greater expansion of the anticyclone from North Africa. On Sunday it will even arrive as far as Denmark. We've, we've traveled, we've been in Florence, we've been in Pisa, and now we've come here at the hottest weekend, and I am struggling, I am very struggling. Uh, I also have to have an inhaler. Uh, because of the heat, etc., with my, my breathing. And Greece is battling several wildfires which have caused smoke to cover parts of the capital Athens in a haze, having warnings for extreme weather conditions for the rest of the week. I'm a resident of Varnavas. They asked us to evacuate our houses a long time ago, and I've been told that the fire has entered and spread through the village. And what I heard is the fire is coming to Microcori. The situation is chaotic. Our military unit has been here from the beginning, and we're trying to help the fire unit and the volunteer teams. You can see we're surrounded by fire here. 
the night will be very hard. Meanwhile, in China, authorities raised over 26 million people affected after heavy rains and floods in July. The National Committee for Disaster Reduction and the Ministry of Emergency Management said 1.1 million people were relocated to temporary shelters. Authorities also reported 328 people dead or missing, while direct economic losses amounted to 10.7 billion U.S. dollars. Rainfall expected to persist in central and eastern inland Mongolia, Beijing, Hebei, the Sichuan Basin, and other places, so authorities remain on alert. We now have a second short break coming up, but before, we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English. There you'll be able to re-watch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back. In Palestine, Israeli occupation forces killed at least two journalists this Sunday. Journalist Temin Muammar of the Palestinian Television Network and Abdullah al-Susi of the Al-Aqsa Television Network were killed along with their families in Hanjunis. The Journalist Union denounced that occupation forces killed 168 journalists since October 2023. The union affirmed that the assassination of journalists are systematic crimes committed by the Israeli army and urged the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to open an investigation into Israeli crimes against Palestinian journalists. In this context, the Israeli government renewed a ban on al mayadin media network, including the seizure of its equipment and blockade of its websites. The measure was enforced after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, along with the Knesset, approved the proposal of the head of communications, Lomo Karai. Earlier, Israeli authorities had labeled al mayadin as a threat to the security of Israel and described its journalists as terrorists. The occupied regime went against the network due to it has been covering since the Al-Aqsa flood until nowadays, not only the Israeli genocide in the Gaza Strip, but also Israeli attacks on the West Bank and occupied Al-Quds. Therefore, reporters from al mayadin had been persecuted and even killed as the media network supports Lebanese Hezbollah and the Hamas-Palestinian resistance movement. After the Israeli decision became known, the Pan-Arab News Network, al Mayadin reported in a statement, the decision of the Israeli government and its president evidences the structural choice of the Israeli occupation in confronting the press. The Israeli occupation reveals its hostile face towards free professional media committed to human issues. al Mayadin will not submit to blackmail or pressure, no matter the size or scope of its influence. The media calls on free Arabs and the world to express their rejection of the systematic and ongoing policies of the Israeli occupation against the press. And the Lebanese resistance movement Hezbollah maintains its actions against Israeli targets amidst the bombardment of southern localities. The movement announced the direct hit of its military operations with artillery shells, rockets and missiles as part of the battlefront in support of the Palestinian people and the resistance in the Gaza Strip. The resistance fighters also reported direct hits by targeting Israeli uniform gatherings. They also confirmed the attack on the Israeli site of Al Marsh and the destruction of surveillance equipment at the Al Malkia site. Also in Palestine, the Israeli Occupation Army announced the beginning of a new military operation in Han Yunis and urged the civilian population to evacuate the city. The occupation announced this Sunday an operation in the Al Jala area in the Gaza Strip against the Palestinian resistance after denouncing the launching of rockets against Israel from the area. The Tel Aviv army urged residents to go to safe places despite local media denouncing that Israel is sustaining attacks against several localities in the Gaza Strip and even against areas declared as safe. The new Israeli operation was announced despite criticisms against Tel Aviv after an attack on a school in central Gaza where more than 100 civilians were killed and dozens wounded. And on Sunday, the president of Iran, Masoud Peshkian, submitted the list of his cabinet department 
for a vote of confidence. Among nominated ministers is seasoned Abbas Arakchi for the Foreign Affairs Relations Post. As of Monday, the parliamentary committees will review the proposal as confirmed by the Speaker of Parliament, Mohammad Bakr Kalibaf, after having received the list. In addition to the position of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Esmail Katib is nominated to take over the Ministry of Intelligence, as he had held that post in the, last, in the late President Ibrahim Raisi's term. Meanwhile, for the Ministry of Defense, the nominee is General Aziz Nasir Sadeh, who has served as Deputy Chief of Staff of the Iranian Armed Forces since September 2021. Syria's Foreign Ministry demands the immediate withdrawal of U.S. troops from its territory, and it condemns the practices of the Syrian Democratic Forces militia. On a statement, the Foreign Ministry assured that the SDF perpetrated criminal attacks on the population in their Sor and Hasake provinces and in the city of Kamishli, resulting in the death of Syrian citizens, including children and women. The entity further denounced that the U.S. fighter jets supported that militia by targeting innocent civilians who were defending their families, villages and properties. All the inhuman SDF practices against the eastern and northeastern regions aim at doubling the suffering of Syrians and prolonging the war on them. The Paris 2024 Olympic Games came to an end on Sunday. Let's take a look at the final medal tally. The United States and China shared the same number of gold medals with 40, but the United States led the medal tally due to its 126 medals total. Thus, the second place went to China with 40 gold medals out of 91 total, and in third place, another Asian nation secured to be on the podium, in this sense, Japan, with 20 goals out of 45 total. On the other hand, Brazil finished 20th place with three gold medals and a total of 20 to lead the Latin American and Caribbean countries, while Cuba was placed behind Brazil and 32nd overall thanks to two gold medals out of nine total. With this, we have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website, tesulenglish.net. So join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Tesla English, I'm with Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.